So we look at it. So Anish, uh, welcome. Um, I was telling people very briefly uh, while we were waiting for you to log in, and you know, you know, we have a punchy relationship. But I, I certainly gave you credit for the fact that we were a bit early moving into your talk. But so Anish was playing Terry. What was? Did we, what did we figure out three years ago now? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah three years. You know, as much as you give me old jokes, that three year, like I don't even know anymore. Ever since I graduated, time <laughs> learn has no meaning. Um, but yes, he was an intern over when I was at TMM for OpenShift. Um, helped me out a ton learning about our partners and OpenShifty stuff. So I'm very glad he came back to Red Hat. That's really cool that our interns managed to stick around and it gave me this contact to reach out um, for this talk because, like I said, uh, we needed some kind of ML talk. There was really no getting away from a Python, Python track without that. So uh, with that said, I'm going to turn it over to you two uh, to get started. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Jason. Okay, I think we have it shared. Yep, sharing looks good, and voice on both of you looks good. Sounds good. Fantastic. All right, great. Okay, I'll kick us off then. Um, yeah, hey everyone, I'm Anish Rastana. I'm a software engineer with the AI Center of Excellence, and I've been on the team for about two years now. Um, I'm primarily focused on the Open Data Hub and running it internally at scale. And I'm uh, Chad Roberts. I've been a Red Hatter for uh, a bit over nine years now. Um, in a little over a year, I've been in the AICOE, working with the Open Data Hub and AI library projects. So to give a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today, um, we'll be discussing some of the problems that data science folks those um, based today and how the Open Data Hub project started internally to address them. Um, we will then be introducing what the Open Data Hub is and where it's used. And finally, we will do a deeper dive into some of the technical details as well as a roadmap for the near future. So, so one of our main focuses is discussing intelligent applications, right? Um, how you develop them and what role the platform plays in these in this whole picture. Um, intelligent application sounds like a, a buzzword, right? But basically, they're really just any other application except that they rely on machine learning in some way or the other. And despite the fact that this ML like, portion of your code may be a very small um, contribution to the entire code base, uh, there are a number of additional considerations that you have to make during development. Um, specifically, you need to consider both your data pipeline as well as your machine learning pipeline, um, in addition to your standard you know, developer application pipeline. And um, if you're not careful, uh, these three somewhat independent pipelines can start you know, conflict with, conflicting it with each other and giving you a lot of headaches. So it's always best to keep them aligned from the beginning, right? So the data pipeline is really just about gathering and storing data, right? This data could be data sets which are curated ahead of time. It's data that you're scraping from online sources or just something you came up with on your own machine. Um, and this data needs to be stored, you know, could be in Ceph buckets, spread out across clusters in different regions. And um, if you actually use this data, you need to clean it, you know, perform some data transformations, and then store it in a place that your team can access it. Uh, the machine learning pipeline is the second stage of this whole picture, and it has its own challenges. Um, you usually start with an exploratory, researchy kind of phase where the stuff you build or investigate doesn't end up being used in your final product. Um, you have expensive training jobs that you have to run Sometimes once, sometimes on a repeated schedule. Again, it depends on the application. And finally, you have some sort of trained model that gets included in your application, right? And that, that then shifts into the application pipeline. Um, even then, you will still have to monitor the performance of your model and your application, obviously, right? And then make changes as you need to. So our focus is really on developing and supporting the development of intelligent applications. And that generally requires unifying these three pipelines. Um, one thing I want to call out is that we don't want to do this as like a classic machine learning application. 
but ones that are actually cloud native or you know, intelligent applications for the hybrid cloud. So I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the notion of the cloud, right? Um, at Red Hat, we have a strong focus on cloud development. Um, so on top of everything I just discussed in the last slide, we want to make sure that the intelligent applications we are building and the pipelines we are developing are built from the onset to run as a set of containers or microservices so that they can be deployed directly into just about any cloud environment. Why would you want to do this? Well, it feels a little bit silly talking about the benefits of the cloud in 2020, but the, the key points are that it provides us with greater portability, agility, and scalability for our applications. With the addition of the hybrid context, we could scale different parts of our application with different cloud providers or in our own infrastructures based on any number of criteria we or the business function deem important. So okay, giving you all these benefits, right? Um, how do you go about actually building one of these intelligent applications for the hybrid cloud? How do you do it? Well, um, a bunch of containers don't make an application on their own. And um, for that, you really do need something like a container orchestration platform, such as Kubernetes or OpenShift. Um, these guys contain that last bit of magic sauce for your intelligent apps. So this is a bit where I'd ask people who have heard of Kubernetes to raise their hands, but you know, things change. <laughs> Thanks, Chad. So um, I'm assuming the split's about 70-30, but um, anyways, just to give the full picture, um, Kubernetes is an open source project originally developed by Google uh, to manage their application develop deployment, scaling, and management. It's referred to as a container orchestration platform. Um, the core conceit of Kubernetes is that the basic unit of an application is a container. And you know, as most of us are aware, containers are great, but they can cause a lot of chaos, especially if you try to manually manage all the bits that go into having an application, right? How am I linking these containers together? Or how am I scheduling them? Um, and this is where container orchestration platforms come in. They abstract all that hard work away for you and give you one unified view for managing them. Um, this makes it easier for us to control the security and resources for our applications. And um, I'm sure it kind of goes without saying, but oh well, for people who are familiar with cloud development, it goes without saying. Um, Kubernetes is very popular in this space now, but it still suffers from a few of the same issues that other open source projects suffer from that can keep them from getting widespread adoption in the enterprise space. So to address some of these um, issues, Red Hat decided to develop our own container orchestration platform called OpenShift, which really is an enterprise spin or version of Kubernetes. The platform itself is open source, so you know anyone can go to okd.io and try it for yourself. And in addition to everything, you know all the nice stuff that Kubernetes gets you, OpenShift has a few extra bits and bobs for security, for CI/CD, and for DevOps. Now that I've hopefully given you a quick intro to hybrid cloud intelligent applications and the platforms you can develop on, I'd like to shift gears a bit and talk about how these platforms can benefit data scientists. So has anyone here just tried emailing or using Slack to drag and drop their, you know, IPython, Jupyter, whatever notebooks to share with a colleague? Right, well, how well does that usually work? Well, usually you're going to come back with, oh yeah, you know, do you have these ABC dependencies um, installed on your machine? You know, are they the correct versions? Or, oh shoot, I forgot that, you know, you, you don't have a GPU on your machine, so this notebook won't work. Or, oh yeah, don't make sure to forget, or make sure you don't forget to change the code to refer to the correct directory for your data. Oh yeah, and make sure you've downloaded all the data onto your system. Well, with big data, that's not really realistic either. And <laughs> even when you do get it ported over to your co colleague's environment, um, it's really just a hassle that shouldn't have to exist. There isn't an obvious solution to the problem of sharing reproducible notebooks seamlessly. And that's just between two data scientists. Imagine you have a large team of data scientists who need to work on the same problem, or if you need to hand over your 
application code or ML code to some software engineer to, you know, productionize it. This iterative process is just so much slower and agile than it could be. Um, similar note, or about the need for GPUs or Spark, Clusters, or specialized, you know, compute requirements. Well, companies are not probably not going to buy every data scientist to have a high and deep learning rig with all the latest, you know, gadgets. <laughs> However, they would be more willing to invest in shared hardware that entire teams or, you know, organizations can use. And that's one of the core principles of the cloud, right? Elastic computing. And yeah, that's a big advantage of using cloud here. The final thing I kind of want to touch on is time to value. Um, I think in recent times, we've been slowly moving away from the previous paradigm. But in previous years, um, a common workflow has been, you know, some business function comes in and tells the data scientist, hey, here's a problem. Look into it for two or three weeks and see if you come up with something, right? And then the data scientist goes into a cave, um, come up with some sort of model, and then try to hand it off to a software engineer who builds and deploys an application that uses that model. And um, it's slow. It's prone to errors when the software engineer does some stuff because they're trying to just get it working somehow, and they may lose, you know, key information or insights along the way. And um, being able to shorten that time between notebook POC and deployed prototype is like very important. So these are some of the main problems that data scientists and machine learning as a whole face in the enterprise sphere. And um, I'd like to argue that a containerized approach to data science um, using OpenShift can help alleviate most, if not all, of these issues. So, yeah, there you go. So, how can containers and OpenShift help me, a data scientist, um, solve some of these problems? Well, as far as collaboration goes, notebook notebooks become very portable and reproducible if you're running those containers, right? Um, a team of developers can be working off the same shared storage, the same shared data sets. And if I want to forward my notebook to someone, I can just share the image with them. Um, and it should, well, I say should, it will be guaranteed to run correctly. You could also point them at exposed routes where your notebook is hosted so they can just directly edit it. Um, when it comes to infrastructure, again, shared environments, big cloud, you have DPUs, you have Spark clusters, and this lets you perform, um, you know, actions or whatever you want to call it, which are which go far beyond what your laptop can do. Um, and both of these help really reduce that time to value piece because all your ML code should be able should be run as a container anyways, and if it can, it's very easy to plug into larger applications such as software engineers have already developed. Right, or even if you decide to demo something to your boss, and um, that again makes it much easier for us to go from POC to like an actual deployed application. Next, I'd like to dive a little bit into the Open Data Hub. So initially, when we started, we were aiming to solve some internal problems at Red Hat around machine learning. Um, Instead of each team maintaining their own infrastructures and developing their own support mechanisms for AI, we decided that joining forces internally to create the data hub as a central place to share data, as well as to run AI and ML workloads made more sense. This way, end users could be free from worrying about the complexity of these stacks and really focus on delivering experimentation and using the results of this experimentation to try value. Um, as we started building, out, building it out, we quickly found that data scientists and data engineers have very different requirements from their tools than you know, your DevOps engineers do. Um, they generally prefer workflows that are UI driven, that avoid using the terminal, and they expect the tools to include all their favorite, you know, sometimes very specific ML libraries. As our data scientists continued using the data hub internally, we started building out the Open Data Hub project based on addressing their needs and the challenges they were facing. Um, we quickly realized that a lot of these challenges were also faced by our customers with their own AIML teams. You know, for AIML projects, you'll always have a team of data scientists, data engineers, DevOps, SREs, software engineers, product owners, business developers, you know, the whole gamut, right? Um, and they all need to collaborate and work together um, 
sharing and collaboration is very difficult, as I mentioned previously. And I think having an operator address these problems really helped speed up our um, velocity. Next slide. So now to step back a little bit and talk about developing an AI ML platform. Um, for most companies that are just getting started with adding AI to their products, they start with small teams that are tasked with investigating AI tools and platforms to use. The easiest path is generally to use a, a well-known large proprietary cloud platform. Right? Um, these platforms have most of the tools needed, and they have a very simple point of entry for users. This works great for that initial prototyping phase, but proves to be pretty expensive when you move to the production phase of your AI ML lifecycle. Users also find that their work and their processes are locked into the specific cloud they've chosen. To kind of alleviate this, one of the guiding principles of the Open Data Hub was to give users more flexibility by using open source tools and technologies where possible and allowing users to install the Open Data Hub in the hybrid cloud or the hybrid cloud. So what is it, right? Um, the Open Data Hub is a meta project to integrate open source tools and provide an end-to-end -end AI ML platform on OpenShift. To break that down further, a meta project integrates multiple open source projects into one project that is easily deployed and managed by users. Now, if you look at the diagram, you can see that three, there's three main personas or sets of requirements or pipelines we are addressing. The first is that of the data engineer, right? All your data pipelines. The AI ML workflow starts with prepping and ETLing the data into some data lake or storage system. This data needs to be stored efficiently if you're operating with tons of data, because otherwise it gets very expensive and it needs to be easily accessible by data scientists. The next phase is the actual model development, your ML pipeline. This includes exploration and analysis of incoming data, feature selection, model creation, training, and validation in a cycle. Once you've gone through it a few times and you're happy with what you've you know, come up with, you actually have to serve your ML model in the production environment. This phase should not be a static fire and forget deploy, but a constant series of optimization. Once the model is solved, you need to continue monitoring the performance of the model and making optimizations when necessary, or in some cases, you know, scrapping the model and coming up with something from scratch. You know, I've never had that happen to me, but I've heard stories of this happening. Um, this cycle of monitoring, optimizing, and solving requires input and collaboration from you know, everyone I've mentioned so far. So next, I'll talk about where we're using it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of internal teams at Red Hat using the Data Hub, Open Data Hub, to run AI ML workloads. Um, we have tons of data scientists, you know, working with their own data sets on projects that I'm not necessarily privy to, but we provide the platform for them. Um, and using OpenShift and operators has really simplified our lives and made it easier for us that platform to keep running and for us to adjust things where customers need, you know, hey, I need 64 gigs of memory for something or, you know, adjusting where we need to. Talking about some specific use cases, um, the products and technology DevOps team has or have product release pipelines that generate a ton of runtime logs. Um, all these logs are stored in the data hub and, you know, we, we engage with them for some anomaly detection projects to figure out what logs we actually care about, since I think most of us generally ignore logs. Um, we also have operational metrics for OpenShift 4 clusters stored in the data hub. Um, this data is used for a number of AI initiatives, as well as you know, to simply for DM, PMs or team leads to just make more informed decisions about what work they need to be prioritizing. We also have customer support data that's used in much the same way, things like source reports and customer feedback forms. Now, we don't just have it running internally at Red Hat. Um, we also have the Open Data Hub installed in the Mass Open Cloud, or MOC for short. The MOC is a collaborative effort amongst a number of universities in the greater Boston area, as well as some partners in industry to provide a public cloud based on the Open Cloud Exchange model. 
Um, it's also being used by many data science students and some researchers for the research work and serves as another proving point that open source systems can be built for these large AI workloads. We also have a number of field deployments in verticals such as telco, finance, or oil and gas, which have been very successful at what they were trying to hit. Next, we'll have Chad talk through a little bit about the technical details. All right, uh, thanks, Anish. Um, so I'll start here with uh, an open Data Hub-centric view um, to give some context and help you see maybe where and how Open Data Hub fits into the bigger picture. Um, so yeah, being open and flexible uh, enables Open Data Hub uh, to work well with a wide variety of products and real life use cases. Uh, when we're working with an ever growing list of uh, Red Hat certified partners on integrating their technologies into Open Data Hub uh, to provide the highest quality uh, tool set possible. Um, on to more of the, uh, the techie side of things, I guess here. Um, uh, open Data Hub relies on an OpenShift operator uh, to manage the deployment of the components. Um, but for those of you maybe not too familiar with the concept of operators on OpenShift, um, here's uh, a super bare bones uh, description. So uh, briefly, um, operators uh, can live on your cluster um, and they will constantly monitor uh, your desired state. Um, in our case, that's a set of AI and ML component installations, um, you know, like your Jupyter Hub, et cetera. Um, It'll compare those against the actual state, um, what is currently running um, on your cluster. Um, and from there, um, it will manage the life cycle of your installation, um, including scaling up or down uh, as required based on what you've defined in your custom resource. Um, to change your deployment, you can edit your custom resource and the operator will spring into action um, and instantiate those changes. Um, okay, so some of you may already be familiar with Open Data Hub, maybe fewer here than at some other places um, we've talked. Um, if you used it prior to about June of this year, um, you used what we now call our, our legacy version, um, which is based on our Ansible operator. Uh, even though we have a new version, which I'll be talking about, um, it's worth mentioning that our legacy series uh, is still available in Operator Hub. Uh, and it continues to work as it always has. Um, one important thing uh, that I'll note here uh, is that the legacy version um, supports deployment to a single namespace, um, which differs from um, the newer offering um, that I'll be talking about. Um, going forward, it's unlikely that we'll add additional features um, here, um, but we still certainly would do bug fixes and release those. Uh, a little background for the next part. Um, around the end of last year, 2019, uh, we made the decision to take part in the Kubeflow project um, by taking their manifests. Uh, in the man by manifests, I mean um, like the the cookbook of how to install the components, um, and making sure that the components could be ran on OpenShift. Um, as part of that, we generated a set of manifests that would um, run Kubeflow on OpenShift and contributed uh, those docs back up to the upstream Kubeflow. Um, and we saw it as a good logical fit for us, given the similarities between Open Data Hub and Kubeflow. Um, both provide great tool sets for running containerized, scalable AI and ML workloads. Um, and it turns out that a lot of people that we heard from that were interested in Open Data Hub were also interested in Kubeflow. Um, so we took that and used it as the inspiration for reworking uh, Open Data Hub a bit. Um, so starting back um, with our spring release, which I think was in June this year, um, Open Data Hub is a downstream project of Kubeflow. Um, this relationship really lets us provide the best, most robust set uh, of the in-demand technologies, um, you know, through embracing the power of open source communities, really. Um, we still carry forward the great set of Open Data Hub components um, that the ODH users have been accustomed to. Um, and we're also able to provide the additional components um, that are part of Kubeflow. Um, and we're able to do it on OpenShift, um, which is a big win for those that need the uh, enterprise level everything uh, that comes with OpenShift. 
um, in typical Red Hat fashion, um, our intent is to be as active as possible in the upstream communities, um, just as we have been since the inception of ODH, um, you know, providing insight and solutions so that everyone can benefit from those. Um, so given all that, um, uh, we're now up to um, Open Data Hub Operator 0 0.8, um, which is based around the Kubeflow operator um, with, that manages the life cycle of a Kubeflow or ODH um, installation. Um, under the covers, uh, it uses uh, customize, that's uh, customize with a K, um, against a set of the manifest files um, that define the elements that make up your, um, your component, um, the images being run, uh, environments, other configuration, secrets, what have you. Um, development of those manifests is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, you can develop locally and just run the KFCTL uh, CLI locally, uh, and you're probably in pretty good shape when you try out the operator with them since they both rely on the same underlying uh, customized code. Um, our intent is to do all the of the development in the upstream community um, and only use our own repo uh, for ODH branding. Um, and we've already been able to make some uh, pretty significant upstream contributions. So the upstream downstream uh, relationship uh, seems to be off to a healthy, uh, good start. Um, and, and I noted uh, a couple of minutes back when I was talking about the legacy version um, that it only supports the single namespace deployment. Um, so here I'll mention that the, um, this, the new operator currently only supports a, a cluster wide uh, development. So that, that operator will watch all namespaces, not just a single one. Um, and if you're in the operator hub um, in the OpenShift console um, and you go to install it, this version is the, the beta channel. Um, when you go to install it. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, our first steps um, were to convert all of the existing ODH components so that they could be managed with the new operator. Um, and as of today, um, I think we've accomplished that. Um, uh, so you've probably seen uh, pictures uh, similar to this uh, several times, um, but I think it's an effective way um, to visualize how the various components uh, of Open Data Hub and Kubeflow uh, can come together uh, to cover a wide range uh, of users uh, and use cases. Um, of course, if you don't see a project um, that you think maybe you'd like to see here or should be here, um, drop by our community meetings uh, and let us know. Um, all right, so since this is a Python focused track, um, I should talk about the part of ODH that might be of maybe the most interest, um, Jupyter Hub uh, and the notebooks. Um, our recent release of ODH includes some enhancements to the Jupyter Hub installation that's part of ODH. Uh, the ODH uh, Jupyter Hub install uh, is now nicely integrated with OpenShift and OpenShift authentication. Um, you can use your own custom notebook images if you have some, um, or you could use our um, curated and tested images um, that, that feature up-to-date versions uh, of popular tools and libraries, uh, things that you would expect to find, um, like you know, SciPy, TensorFlow, Spark, um, as well as the, uh, the newest edition, I think, uh, which is Alira, um, which if you're uh, into running pipelines, um, that's, uh, that's a great place uh, to look there. You'll be interested in using that. Uh, as you can imagine, we've been super busy um, getting out our recent release, um, and we still have lots to do. Um, we've recently beefed up our uh, testing, being able to run inside the OpenShift CI system for all the PRs that you might submit in our nightly runs. Um, we, we plan to add uh, OpenShift container storage. That'll be great. Um, and right now we have uh, Kubeflow 1.0 running on OpenShift, um, and we plan to keep updating that, um, all the manifests, so you can keep getting the latest Kubeflow bits as well. Um, and now you can also mix components from ODH and Kubeflow. Um, we have instructions how to do that. Um, so if you want to have your PyTorch operator running with the other ODH components, uh, you can definitely do that. Um, and for our next release at the end of October, um, we'll have all of the ODH components running on the UBI-based images, the universal base image. 
Um, and then uh, disconnected deployment, the air gapped deployment, uh, that's an often requested feature that's on the list as well. Um, and of course, upstream contributions uh, wherever possible. Uh, if you want to give it a try, um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you can go to the operator hub inside your OpenShift console, search for Open Data Hub. Um, uh, you'll click install, uh, then subscribe, and you'll want to make sure that the beta channel is selected. I think it's the default. Um, you'll create that KF def object. Um, the one from our repo is here on the slide. It, it installs everything, um, but you can make a custom one easily um, by just removing the components that you don't need. Uh, then you can head right over to opendatahub.io um, and try out a tutorial. Um, uh, so here's the uh, the wrap up slide, I guess. Um, to sum it up, um, ODH, uh, it's of course an open source community and we welcome uh, engagement and contribution. Our meetings are every two weeks on Mondays at noon Eastern US time. Um, and it would make my day to see you there. Uh, if you can't make it there, um, hit us up on the mailing list or through GitHub. We try to be super responsive. Um, and there's our top level site, opendatahub.io. Uh, there's all the docs and tutorials. Uh, thanks so much.